It might be the, um, I'm just going to unplug it for a minute and plug it back in again. This might be the, the place where I get that response. So, um, sorts of things I'm interested in. Um, fit in with the theme of this conference um, in that I'm not necessarily going to be talking about academic publications themselves, but I'm talking about kind of the academic use of published material in the UK. And that covers a kind of huge range of things. I was kind of really interested in the text part of this, and I'll come to that later on. Um, so in the library, we collect um, UK publications under something called Legal Deposit, um, which changed quite radically about six years ago to allow the collecting of digital publications as well, which has really made a, a kind of massive kind of cultural as well as kind of technological change, I think, that we're still sort of understanding and unpicking. But we do things like collect um, e-books, mainly as e-pubs, um, e-journals, mainly as PDFs, because you can't get them as e-pubs. And we've got about 5 million now um, in the collection, so it really has shifted the, the texture of the collection. Um, but we also have a web archive program um, that's, I think, hitting 15 years old now, um, and has been domain crawling uh, for the well, past six years. Um, and as well as the collections that we build, um, we're also interested in the services that we can build around them. Um, so most active in kind of research methods um, around things like digital object identifiers, how you kind of improve citation, particularly for things like data sets. Um, with a kind of UK hub for data sites, and we're looking at, and we have various projects running that look at how you kind of connect these digital object identifiers to all kids, so personal identifiers. Um, so that people can be recognised for the work that they do, particularly kind of things that kind of form um, slightly different types of research outputs. But I want to kind of talk about two examples, and I think I've left myself enough time for this. First one is the web archive. Um, so I've talked a little bit about that, and I wanted to show you a thing. And first off, just see if you recognised it. Um, got that, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, has anyone seen this already? I'll explain what it is in a minute. Um, so, um, is it alive? Sorry? <laughs> it's right, it's not infectious, um, if anyone's worried about that. Um, it was made, made, made by a colleague of mine at the library. Um, so, with the web archive, um, over the past 15 years, and certainly since the main crawl has come in, we've collected a lot of stuff. Um, we collect kind of anything published to the UK web that we can identify. Um, that's typically something like two to four billion items a year. Um, we have millions of websites and we collect lots of instances of them. Usually kind of one, one big crawl of the domain each year, but then um, for sites that we see of particular interest or we think are changing particularly fast, particularly relevant, um, we will collect more frequently and in more focus and in more depth. And um, I'm sure you can guess what we're mostly doing at the moment. Um, the archive web pages, when we play them back, look a bit like this. Um, and this is what I mean. And this is when I, you know, I, I think this is text. Um, and I thought that was unproblematic, but I'm, I'm sure some people will disagree with me. Um, as we're building kind of web comic collections, and I just come from a comics conference where we were kind of having that sort of slightly interesting discussion of kind of like. Is it text? Are people reading comics? Are they viewing them? Are they doing something else? So it's, it's sort of, it, it takes kind of a broad, broad range. Um, how do you cite this? How would you refer to it in a way that's permanent and people can get back to it and understand what you're talking about? We're kind of starting to get to that, to that <coughs> answer through kind of using the, the, the URI from the web archive, which is both kind of machine readable but basically comprehensible to a human as well. Um, so it kind of describes where the playback's coming from, so that the UK web archive through its wayback machine. Um, you've got a date and time stamp there, so you know when it was collected, because we collect more than one instance, and you can kind of pick that up. Um, from the calendar we can change the instance, uh, and you can see that the URI will eventually change to catch up. Um, and it also gives you the, the original um, location for the work. So, that's not everything, by any means. It doesn't tell you things like what didn't we manage to capture from the website when we, kept, when we collected it. Um, it doesn't also point out that we did this kind of automated, in an automated fashion, so it was a robot going to collect it rather than somebody sitting in a web browser. So 
our experience, our little robots experience of the website may well have been different to somebody else's experience of the website if they were using a different browser. Sometimes that's really, really significant. Um, and so it, it doesn't tell you everything, but it's a start. And if you can get this far, quite well supported. Um, but we are aware that there are kind of other issues and um, uh, kind of problems around kind of how do people access this content and what do they need to know about it when they're accessing it. Um, so we, we're really lucky um, to get some funding for a placement, and that was from the National Centre for Research Methods here at Southampton, and we had Jess Ogden working with us um, for a number of months, trying to answer the question of what is it people need to know when they're using this material and when they're accessing archive web content. And she came up with like a number of um, really a really good start at sort of trying to understand what the problems might be. So one is orientation within the website. I'll just jump back to the, the pre-design. Um, so it's kind of like web archiving now kind of represents a sort of system of knowledge within itself. It's quite kind of a small group of um, institutions and specialists working on it. But we talk about things like kind of crawls and harvests and instances and targets and so on. And we kind of have in our head this knowledge of what's happening. Two minutes. Two minutes. I'm only going to talk about web archiving today. Um, so, um, but actually that generates a set of content that is quite lumpy and, and distinct. So a kind of frequent crawling gathers more data from very specific sites than say our whole domain crawl, which is only visiting something once a year. So when you're searching it and getting results, that makes a difference. Um, we're not able to capture some things, we are able to capture others, so there are absences within the archive. And how do we explain those absences to people when they're using them so they can use them in, in confidence? Plus our activity is impacted by a whole range of human factors, so things like the regulation within which we work, the policy we then derive from that, and the human choices we make within that policy about kind of what we're going to um, uh, prioritise above other things. Um, and then lastly, just thinking about what kind of access is needed, which is where I'm getting to this point now. Um, so we present at the moment <coughs> our websites as instances of the view of the website like that, and um, you can search them and get a huge, huge long list of, of results because we do a full text index of everything, um, and then you kind of pick through to find instances. But is that actually the way that people want to see it? Do people actually want to see the code? Do people actually more concerned about what the networks and connections might be? And is there kind of other ways of viewing this data that is useful for research and for actually kind of making sure you have successful research questions? So this is produced by my colleague Andy Jackson, his technical lead for the Web Archive. It's showing what our browsers are doing right now. Um, so these dots are all domains, and the size of the dot varies depending on the amount of data we're managing to capture. The, um, the lines are links between different parts of domains, and the thicker the line, the more the link. And that um, does something other than show you an individual archive website. It shows you something about kind of the ecology of your web as we're interacting with it. So, a few examples. I think this is. So, if they say, okay, this is really, this is a this is a discussion forum about skyscrapers, <laughs> and it just like jumps out to lots and lots and lots of other different sites and people participating in the forum. Somewhere here is Eventbrite. There we go. And that has lots and lots and lots of links. And I think So the changes we see is that over as defined the That's that's as the crawler's working. So the live. crawler is kind of visiting and collecting. Oh, so is it live? Yeah, it's live. It's live. So, so it is alive. It's it's alive. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's alive. It's a it's a little robot. And these sorts of things, usually in newspapers, if they've got just one really strong two blobs and a strong link between them, because it's generally the Daily Mail was up here yesterday. Um, it's generally the site of the newspaper and then where they put the photos and the kind of strong links between the two. But you can start to understand something. And is this actually kind of what people need to interpret the results they're getting rather than kind of list of text and so Thank you very much. There was a talk of different views by Howard. This is a different view. Questions, please? Hi. Right. Sorry, I have to get myself on tongue tied. Right, the meaning of texts can change quite dramatically based on the viewpoint that someone is actually presenting that text with. So, for example, someone in the complementary world will view a text on the way mushrooms work totally differently than 
someone as a medical doctor. So how do you deal with the different viewpoints that the text is written by someone in the complementary world compared to a doctor written in the other world? I see some people writing text for different audiences or kind of they, they present they're coming, text in they're coming way. with different basic starting points as to the viewpoints and how something works. Right. I'm, so I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question completely. I think I think for us, the way we'd want to approach it is well, when we spoke to people, because the, the other thing I was going to talk about is kind of what we do about more kind of complex types of publications. And we, when we spoke to people about that, um, and this is an example of what I mean. So this is a, a, a kind of documentary project about um, uh, the Arab Spring in Cairo. And she was kind of writing down what people she spoke to talked about. And this is sort of a network diagram. So if you kind of go from, say, transitional period, we'll say they also talked about those things as well. And you can kind of get detail on that. And so, so we're coming back to your question is, is um, when we spoke to people about well if we're collecting this what is important when we're collecting and able to play it back and they spoke about things like um, authenticity and they spoke things spoke about things like context. So what mattered to them was that the kind of authorial intent of the person writing was somehow captured and represented when we kind of played it back or as we collected it. Which comes to the question of kind of well, what happens when we can't collect everything about a publication? What's the important thing to collect? So for us, I think when you're coming back to kind of somebody writing a piece from a complementary <coughs> point of view, you might write it differently or present it differently to somebody from uh, a kind of biomedical sciences point of view. Is we'd want to um, somehow be able to capture the context and be able to kind of make sure people understood what the context in which it was produced. And then we could represent it kind of as faithfully and it's in kind of using kind of the, the, the kind of technology and structure and environment around it. And that's a big challenge for us. And I'm not sure I answered your question, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of what it meant to me. Yeah, thank you. I would say you know, partly in arms from part of the stuff <coughs> the context is very important to the fact that we're in the text is the humanities we can actually build models that include people as entities. So we could either work problem is, in things like GDPR, it's very hard to do that now. Mm. For current people, even though now for 50 years, the historians are going to want to construct what they um, So, in a way, some of these regulations actually need to effectively be deletion of the history. Mm. I think there's a, is there like an ethical, is that, I wonder if there's an ethical question in there as well as a legal one. I mean, yes. it's partly to do what we're doing with flights on the web, is with flights on the web a lot of personal information about living people yeah. who we assume knew they were publishing it. Um, <laughs> but there, 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 there is a big Sorry, my guts in, uh, uh, in the in the sort of the ethics of archivists and the, oh, the sorry. complaint with history is that you know it's only told by the victors and the winners and the powerful people because they're the only people who get this five to say, what about the records of the ordinary people? In most cases they don't want to be collected. They're, they're quite happy, uh, and that's what GDPR is about. So there's that cost me about okay, we want to tell the real story, but it's a story that is reluctant to be told. Thank you. Thank you.